So I'm talking to artists for the most part, but I will tell you that we're all scientists. And that's how our bodies survive, because we make predictions on empirical information and empirical experience, and here we are. So we are all scientists. Uh, we don't think that way necessarily, or don't think that we are, but we are. Some of us are lucky enough, and that doesn't include me, to be artists, and that of course saves the spirit to a, a large extent. Uh, and I'm, what I, this, I'm showing you a picture here, which is almost a cliche, and I recognize that. And it's also, uh, it's all in dentist waiting rooms. I mean, it, it's almost everywhere, this picture. So why would I insult you by starting with a picture like this? Well, it's because actually Van Gogh really was a scientist at heart as well. He started, as you, as you all know, I'm sure, as trying to be a priest. Uh, and he kept his worshipful, worshipful view of the way uh, one should be in this universe. And he kept it, but he changed it to trying to understand and actually worship the universe. So if you look at a picture like this, it does seem <coughs> obvious until you realize aspects to it. And I'm not sure how many people would uh, see, see so many things in this, and I really can't tell. I mean, but I would say it is an interesting question, which is the least durable structure in this painting? You can think about it, you it's can even answer it. It's the steeple. It's the steeple. It's, it's this crystalline village down here. And it's an ironical picture. People don't think of Van Gogh as ironical, but this is ironical. It's sad, but these people just don't understand the nature of this universe, which is very far from equilibrium. And actually, it's all the beautiful things that we really admire are far from equilibrium. They're not the crystals on the, the mantelpiece. They're the extraordinary uh, hurricanes, as long as one is a uh, safe dif distance away from them, uh, uh, the water, big waterfalls and so forth. They're all expending energy, because that's what the un universe does. It, everything is downhill, I'm afraid, energetically in this universe. And he's grasped this. And he he had to have his mind, which was rather like Beethoven's to my mind, to really understand the nature of this universe. And so if you look carefully at this, all those stars are different colors, because all those stars are different colors. Uh, he knows where, this, and this, by the way, is a, a, he, he's really looking carefully at this. That's Venus, of course, this is the moon, this is the sunrise at 4 a.m. Uh, and right in the middle here is this extraordinary structure, which we're all kind of used to. You, know, you can think of it as a yin-yang sign or something. But actually, it's galaxy M51. And this is the first, to my knowledge, the first painter who ever thought to put a galaxy in the sky. So everything here, apart from that village and that steeple, is far from equilibrium. And actually, when it comes down to trying to understand science, that's what we look for. These far from equilibrium systems, they're the ones that really are going to explain to us how the universe works at various levels. My particular interest is the emergence of life, which is because it, it ha happens for a reason. Uh, and it's because the, the planet itself is far from equilibrium. So just out of interest, what sci scientists can do, for example, if they're persuaded by uh, somebody called uh, Alfred Boehm, who was at UCLA and published this lovely paper in 1984 in Arts Magazine, he actually got the Griffiths Observatory to turn back the observatory to 19th of June, 4 a.m. on 18, 1989. And sure enough, that's what it looks like, just about. Uh, he, he, of course, he's taken some poetic license, understandably, because he wants to try to show the total dynamism of, of, this, uh, of this structure. So this, to me, is extremely inspiring. But interestingly, it was first discovered, this galaxy that I'm going to tell you about, uh, in 1845 in Ireland, in the biggest, at that time, the biggest telescope in the world. It was the biggest telescope for about 45 years. Now, Ireland is not the place to put an observatory, I admit that. But <laughs> Nevertheless, he, this, this is what he found. This is the Ross uh, telescope, and this man was an extraordinarily interested scientist, and, of course, he was good at draftsmanship as well. And he drew this uh, Earl of Ross's drawing of galaxy M51. This is the first, understand, uh, first drawing of a proper galaxy. Up to that time, they've been called nebulae. So if we think about that... So here's the galaxy M51. It's not just the galaxy. And you'll notice, by the way, it's not just one galaxy. There's something else over here. So he's got that in his mind. And also, I suspect that this part is probably a comet's tail. To, so he's put everything he can think of, really, about this dynamic universe, as deeply as he can think about it. And this is the Whirlpool galaxy, M51, actually pictured by Hubble, uh, one of JPL's 
uh, telescopes. And you can see there is a second galaxy here. And indeed, it, that, it's probably that second galaxy that gives this extraordinary structure. Now, we see this. You know, the universe actually doesn't have very many shapes to choose from. And this is a major type of structure. We're, we can see this structure when we look, even in the bath, when we let the water go. We get a vortex, which is not unlike that. But this will be, there'll be a black hole in the middle of this, uh, be, being the energy that uh, is drawing this and making this spin round in this way. If you ever look at a large whirlpool, how about looking to see not only... It's counterintuitive, by the way. The way the whirls go round is counterintuitive. But have a look at that whirlpool and see if you can see the waves that actually go out. And is it fair to say that that's the analogy to gravitational waves from the black hole, which is hugely dense? So next time you see a large vortex in a pool because of the sinkhole, just see if you can see the waves coming out as well. You can't see them in this because you can't see gravitational waves, and nobody's found them yet, but Einstein says they're there, and nearly everything else he said was on the ball. <laughs> so let's... But we've had these views... That, 5,000 years ago, there wasn't any distinction between art and science or engineering. This, it's all, to me, this is one of the most wonderful structures on the planet. It's 500, built 500 years before the pyramids. And I've called it, it's a tomb, basically, but it's also a womb in the thoughts of these people because actually the sunlight was coming in of a winter's solstice uh, and uh, fertilizing the three. Uh, skeletons that are kept right in the womb because they are expected to be reborn. So I'd like to think of it as, as a tomb and a womb. Let's just have a quick look at this. Uh, and here we are, we're back to spirals. And of course we know that spirals are throughout history and art. Uh, but th th these are extraordinary, five to my mind, 5,000 years ago. I'm not going to go into detail about them. And of course there are various views of why, why they're there and what they mean. But let's just look at an, I mean, this is a particularly beautiful one. This is on the stone as you go into uh, the New Grange. Uh, it's only about 30 miles from Dublin, by the way. And then if you go into the, which is almost sacrilegious to my mind, to go into the, in, in here, but here's the sun, comes in uh, at the, at the uh, shortest day, and right just where all the skeletons are, or were, uh, then you find this kind of structure, this three ring, three spiral stone, uh, which is a beautiful structure. Of course, you may have seen it on uh, Maori's uh, tattoos on shoulders and so forth. It's, it's a long-time structure. But of course, it is that structure that captures the way a lot of the universe works. And, and what we want to think about it, I don't, I don't mind. I mean, it, it is inspiriting, of course, uh, this, these spirals. And we can put our own conditions on them, if you like. I mean, maybe it is the winter to summer to winter again, and maybe it is the offspring. But here's one here, from, that's from Ireland, and this is the one from uh, Northern uh, America, from uh, Native American uh, sculpture, uh, art. And you can see, well, I don't have to say more. And of course, it goes through art time and time again. And what many artists have picked up on, people like Turner and Millet and so on, are the far from equilibrium nature, far from equilibrium nature of uh, the at atmospherics, we atmospheric weather. And here, this is one from uh, a picture from uh, China, 1770. So this is a storm, a major storm in China. But you will notice we can't get away from these whirlpools. These, this kind of this basic uh, algorithm of the way these systems work. So. So my actual interest is in working on the emergence of life, and I recognize it's because the planet is far from equilibrium. It has a job to do, and we know what the standard job for a planet to do is it's very hot in the center. They're always hot in the center. They want to lose energy. How do they lose energy? We don't have to go to another planet to know how they're going to lose energy. They lose energy by convection. Convection in the core, convection in the mantle of the Earth, convection in the crust of the Earth, hydrothermal convection, convection in the uh, water itself, in, in the ocean, and uh, convection in the atmosphere, of course, before that heat is radiated space. So here's the Hadean water world, four billion years ago, when life probably uh, started, maybe a bit before then. It was not a nice place to be. I mean, the idea, of, some of you may have heard of, is Darwin's little pond. Forget it. There are, you've got to unlearn things in, in things about the origin of life. There is no pool here. It's, it's a water world. And it's far from equilibrium water world. It's five or six uh, hour days. So you, if you know about the roaring 40s, I mean, think what the weather was like. There's no flora to take up the slack here. These hurricanes are going to go round and round and round. You're not going to start life on the surface of this planet. It's just too wild. Uh, there's, in, there's impacts from meteorites. There's eight times the present UV radiation. 
Uh, so I think we need to get out of there, but we've got to think about why life would start. So while we go back to a, a standard structure, and of course this is a, a convective system in the atmosphere, it's to remind us that perhaps this is what uh, some of the early Earth's atmosphere, this is what was happening in the early Earth's atmosphere. So it's getting rid of its physical energy, if you like. The planet's doing quite well. But at the same time as getting rid of its physical energy, it's actually generating hydrogen. So it's getting rid of its physical energy by these convection cells, but out comes hydrogen. Now we all know that's a great fuel, or at least carrier gas, and yet high temperature volcanic, volcanoes are going to generate carbon dioxide. Now carbon dioxide, and, and actually carbon dioxide is very oxidized. You know, we think erroneously that uh, all oxidized atmospheres should have oxygen in them. I mean, this is very weird. This is because of life, because of photosynthesis. A planet with carbon dioxide and H2O, water, is oxidized in its exterior, whereas the in inside, we say, is bringing hydrogen, for example, from things like native iron uh, in, in the mantle. So that means that the ocean wasn't just uh, wild and... Uh, and tempestuous, but it was also carbonated, so it had a pH of about 5.5. And I'm being a little facetious, I guess, by saying, don't forget, that is how we like it, pH 5.5. I mean, <laughs> you can even advertise that. <laughs> now, hydrogen plus carbon dioxide actually wants to make methane, okay? And we've all heard of that. This is the frightening uh, greenhouse gas. And that's what, that's what happens. Hydrogen plus carbon dioxide reacts slowly to produce methane without any help except from geochemistry. Okay, so it's, it's something that happens. So it, it's kind of resolving the disequilibrium. Okay, so we've got, we know that convection resolves the disequilibrium of heat, but generating methane is resolving the chemical disequilibrium because the very fact of convection is actually producing chemicals that are far from equilibrium. So if you like, what I'm going to tell you is that metabolism takes over from these convection cells. So we have these nice convection cells, but if you think about it, all metabolism is always related to convection. You know, even if it's just bringing the, the rain to the, to the water to the land through rain, or the fisher folk knowing exactly where to go in the ocean for their updra updrafts and their downdrafts. Oh, mostly the ocean is a desert. Uh, and there's also a potential produced acetate, uh, which is vinegar. So, but it's, it's not such a good potential this, but it, it, this, it could happen. So that's the, for sorry, it's just sli split off here, CH3COH, it doesn't matter the formula particularly. Notice that all these reactions produce water. All living, I mean, there we are, we, we produce water. Now these reactions I'm interested in is how can we quicken them to life? And I'm using that word carefully. The word quick, as in the quick and the dead, cutting to the quick. We want to, it's not just speeding up, it's enlivening these systems. How can we enliven them? So let's think about how that might take place. Well, where would it happen? Uh, well, many people have thought of these things called black smokers, which are 400 degrees centigrade, and they come into the ocean, they're spectacular, they're down a kilometre or so down on the ocean floor, uh, they're driven by uh, volcanic material coming up close to the surface of the bottom of the ocean, and you get these lovely structures, and life does seem happy here. I mean, you might be able to see, there's a crab here, for example, plenty of nice uh, tube worms, you often get fish around here. So I can understand why people thought that that might be the case, but it's really much too hot, too spasmodic. I mean, 400 degrees centigrade is higher than the melting point of lead, so I don't think we need to think uh, that this is the right place. So what do we do? Right, we forget what we've learned about these things. We try and clear the decks. And one of the, one of the interesting areas for me in terms of art is well, that's what the surrealists did. So th there they are. They're, they're, we've got this extraordinary cultured Europe with these wonderful painters, this wonderful music. And yet then we have this war between 1914 and 1918, which is entirely bestial. Culture didn't do anything to help this. You know, we, we prided ourselves on being cultural, but it didn't help. So the surrealists said, well, let's clear the decks and start again. And to my, my favorite surrealist, the early surrealist, it could have been ARP if I'd been brought up uh, appreciating sculpture, but uh, as it is, it's uh, Yves Dongui, and he was, uh, it's probably worth a little story, he, he is uh, a merchant navy man, he lives in Brittany, he's, he's on furlough in Paris, he's, he's on this tram, and he sees a picture by Kiriko, a, a portrait of his father, he jumps off the tram, uh, looks at it, and he thinks, right, I'm going to become a painter. He goes back to Brittany, paints everything white, including the windows, and his first major painting was Dior, outside, from inside. Now, this is an incredible painting, to my mind. I mean, not only do we have these kind of biomorphic structures, 
but we also have this sense of the, of, of the three dimensions of uh, space and the four dimensions as we kind of blow time across these dimensions, and they are distorted, of course. So this, this fellow, you know, this, I don't want to meet many of these people, but Yves Tanguy would have been a pretty interesting guy. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not saying we, we, we uh, were influenced too much by this, but what I am saying is that we have a very similar attitude to this. Let's start from scratch. So starting from scratch, and this is rather it's crude, but what we're doing is trying to work. At, we've got a reactor here. You don't have to know much about it except to, to see, see that we're trying to reproduce conditions on the early Earth four billion years ago. So we take what we think are those conditions, we put them in a reactor, and we take the fluid from that reactor and put them into what we think was called the Hadean or the hellish ocean four billion years ago or, or more. And we get this structure, the hydrothermal mound. And to me, this kind of structure, this kind of bulbous structure with many little compartments in it is where life actually started. This is the hatchery of life, to my mind. And what is it doing? It's solving the problem of hydrogen and carbon dioxide being out of equilibrium. And it's a very slow process in geochemistry, but biochemistry comes along and solves the problem and quickens this reaction to generate things like methane and acetate and so on. But they're the two initial... Uh, chemicals. So here we have an ocean. It's four billion year old ocean. It's called the Hadean Ocean. It's carbonic. It means it's acidic. It's got a pH of five to six for those people who are used to that kind of language. Here the water goes down into the crust of the earth and it becomes entirely altered. It changes to an alkaline solution, a bitter alkaline solution, pH about 10 or 11. And, and it also picks up hydrogen, a little bit of methane, as we've heard. And the hydrogen comes from water because the oxygen in the water has oxidized the iron to make it rusty. So hydrogen is left over. So here comes the fuel. Up comes the fuel. And it's going to come out. And it's going to titrate into this ocean. Except, as every artist knows, the real key to creativity is frustration. You know, you can't do something. You've got to have the boundaries. What are these boundaries? And these, the boundary here is the kind of fouling up of this system because as this solution tries to get out, it actually precipitates mineral and it makes little membranes. But those mem membranes are inorganic. They're not organic. They didn't rain down from space. They're actually just inorganic membranes made of silica and iron sulfide and nickel and so forth. All those metals that came out of the black smoker that we still need need and buy occasionally from the chemist's shop. So here's the solution coming out, here's this structure, and then we can find in our uh, hydrothermal mineral deposits to show that actually we have actually got iron sulfide, in this case, little vacuoles or, or bubbles. So these are the kind of little eggs, so to speak, in the hatchery from which life first started. Of course, I can't go into too much detail, but it's to give you the sense that this is what it was like. Well, fortunately, about 10 years after we published this uh, thesis, uh, such a spring, a similar kind of spring, was found in the Atlantic Ocean, which generates hyd has hydrogen and carbon uh, methane coming out of it. Uh, it's got a pH of 11, so it's alkaline. Of course, the present-day ocean is rather alkaline itself, so, that, so not much changes there. But in the original place, you can imagine that you've got a kind of gradient. So it's all about gradients. So you've got, you know, we think of energetic gradients, the requirement in the morning to have the coffee, to get the energy going, to have that kind of gradient which you spend during the day as you generate entropy, by the way. Uh, here comes the, here come the, uh, the gradients. The great gradients are pH gradients. That's, that actually converts to 300 millivolts. And we live off about 300 millivolts. You know, we are partly electrical. Uh, we've also got a temperature gradient, uh, and, and even what's called a redox gradient. It's more oxidized out here than it is in here. Everything, everything that life requires is here, in this kind of system. All the metals, every requirement, including the fact that these things last for 10,000 to 100,000 years. Plenty of time for life to start, in my opinion. So here we can put them together and remind ourselves that, okay, this is what we make, and this is how uh, Yves Tongui thought about just starting from scratch. And of course you can see that he was, uh, at least the echoes of the fact that he was uh, in the Merchant Navy, the French Merchant Navy. And you can see here's the, the ocean, here's the uh, ocean floor with various biomorphs, but especially this biomorph. Extraordinary structure and not dissimilar to our biomorphs. So that's it. Uh, <laughs>